Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time. Today with Zach joining us from T-Trade, the head of product, to talk about the future of Service Mesh. It's going to be a very important discussion for teams moving to zero trust and adopting next generation access control. So stay tuned for another 10 minutes. We're going to get started. If you want to share, you're here with us today. Put your name in the comment section so we can highlight you on the screen. And if you have questions, start with the queue so we know it's a question. We're going to have a lot of questions already for Zach. So stay tuned. 10 minutes, we'll get started.
Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In Any of Time. We're going to get started about uh, five minutes now with Zach joining us from T-Tray, the head of product, to talk about the future of Service Mesh. Uh, very important for the next generation access control and for discussions around the implementation of zero trust down to the container level. So stay tuned for another five minutes. In the meantime, if you want to share you here with us, uh, put it into the comment section below. So if you want to uh, have a, if you have a question, uh, start with the queue so we know it's a question in the comment section as well. And uh, finally, if you've not checked uh, our uh, mailing list, uh, subscribe now at in the nick of time TV. And of course, uh, if you want to take a look at uh, our new t-shirts, uh, uh, do that by going to the, the store at the store uh, dot in the nick of time TV and all the profits go to the uh, Fisher house. So um, this is obviously uh, great for our uh, wall fighter as well. So go check that out, um, and uh, you'll see uh, quite a quite a lot of uh, fun T-shirts. Uh, and if you have ideas of new designs, uh, please do send it to us so we uh, we can get them ready for the uh, for next month. So stay tuned for another five minutes. We'll get started.
Good morning, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time today with Zach joining us from T-Tray, the head of product, to talk about the future of Service Mesh and uh, why this is so important to your identity management, next generation access control, and of course, uh, zero trust implementation. So stay tuned. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting episode. If you have questions for Zach, do start asking the questions now because we have already uh, about 15 questions or so. So uh, uh, please do that in the comment section by starting with a Q. Also, if you want to share, you're here with us today. Uh, just put your name and uh, your company so we can highlight you on the screen. And then finally, um, here is a reminder for everybody to subscribe to the show so we don't depend on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, will to share the dates of the show to you guys. So in the nick of time.tv, you're going to get an email per week on our new videos and content coming up. So uh, check that out uh, at uh, in the nick of time.tv. Of course, wanted to remind everybody Learn with Nick is here now. Uh, we are crossing the 3,000 subscribers, 4,000 subscribers now. Uh, so check out the uh, the 50% uh, off for military civilians and uh, <coughs> uh, veterans. Uh, and uh, give us updates on the, the content and what you see there, what's missing, what kind of uh, new video you would like to see. In fact, we just released uh, uh, this week, uh, you'll see this uh, video on, uh, on Eastio, <coughs> which is very good uh, uh, timing for this discussion today. Uh, so if you don't know enough about Eastio, the service mesh, and you want to catch up and uh, uh, go from zero to 60 uh, with Titrate, uh, check that uh, new video on uh, learnwithnick.com. Uh, you'll see uh, about two and a half hours of great content on Service Mesh. Uh, so that's our, our latest uh, video that uh, uh, came up, uh, came out uh, just uh, this week. Now, I uh, wanted to remind everybody we have this new store uh, in the nick of time, store in the nick of time TV. All profits go to the Fisher House. Uh, so check that out. Um, we have fun t shirts um, and uh, different uh, goodies. So uh, if you have ideas of new design, let us know too. We are looking for new design for uh, next month. So uh, let us know. Uh, and like I said, all profits go to the Fisher House Foundation. So 100% uh, of them. Um, <clears throat> now, I uh, wanted to also remind you that Monday, we're going to be launching our Cloud Native Town. In fact, that's going to be used for the big event that uh, Rob Slaughter and the Defense Unicorn team are setting up uh, with this three-day event uh, uh, on uh, introduction to DevSecOps, where we're going to have a full industry day uh, with uh, de dedicated rooms uh, with different companies and different topics, Air Force, Space Force, you name it, Platform One will be there. Uh, so check it out. Uh, uh, we're going to make this big announcement on Monday, and uh, it's going to be free to use. Anyone can go on the Metaverse and uh, uh, engage with uh, the, the, the teams. And we, we have telcos, banks, healthcare companies, uh, seven nations. So it's going to be a lot of great content, new videos every week, completely free to use. So uh, uh, you'll see that uh, pretty soon. If you want to get a uh, uh, kind of early access to it, you can go to uh, uh, cloudnative.town. Uh, cloudnative.town. I'll put it on the screen so you can uh, uh, check it out now. It's uh, still getting finished, but um, you know it's good enough for you to play with it. So uh, go check it out. I'll put it on the screen in a second. So you have the link, cloudnative.town. So um, it's going to be fun, uh, completely free to use, and uh, uh, you'll see the Industry Day will be a lot of fun too. So uh, you'll find a lot of great content, Savvy Smash, DevSecOps, Kubernetes, uh, SRE, SLAs, SLOs, you name it. Uh, and then every company out there on the CNCF stuff from HashiCorp to Data to IQ to Red Hat to uh, Aqua to Docker to Rancher uh, to T Trade to Acorn, you name it, Elastic. Um, a lot of great companies on there sharing their content, uh, sharing their releases. Uh, uh, doing events to announce their new features. It's going to be a great community to keep up and make sure we don't uh, get behind. So uh, this is going to be great. Um, all right. So let's see. Zach uh, is going to join us in a second, but I want to uh, do a, a good job because Zach is an ex exceptional person. Not only uh, he does not have uh, the my ego, which is as big as the Empire State, but uh, Zach is getting things done. Is uh, uh, really the a uh, founding uh, engineer behind uh, T-Trade, but of course behind Istio at Google uh, at, during his time at Google is, is helping now drive the, the product uh, decision as a head of product at T-Trade. Uh, like I said, he was the earliest engineer on the Istio project at Google, uh, and he sits as a committee elected uh, representative on the project the steering committee. Uh, he's written and he's been helping NIST uh, for many years now 
uh, including uh, as a co-author of the uh, NIST uh, special publication 800-204A if you and B, of course, if you've missed those, go check them out. He's working on a new uh, publication now. He's going to tell us a little bit about it today. Uh, before, of course, uh, teacher Ray Zaka was at Google uh, on both Eastio and uh, across the uh, cloud uh, uh, platform at Google. And uh, you'll see that uh, uh, Zach really uh, understands where the future of uh, uh, this service mesh uh, discussion is going to go to and is going to lead the way to get us there with him so we can understand effectively what to do and when to do it and what to pay attention to. It's a very fast-moving environment. So I'm so excited to have the chance to have Zach here with us. So let's bring him uh, on the screen. Uh, welcome, Zach. Hey, thanks for having me. It's you? a pleasure to be back. Yeah, so that's the second time for you on the show, but this time we're going to be focusing on, you know, the future, you know, what you've been working on for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, we did kind of tease about it a little bit, uh, obviously, when you came on the show last time, but this is going to be a, a deeper dive and uh, people are going to be able to really see uh, what it takes to move out of place of relevance. It's not easy. Uh, for people that missed maybe the last episode, I'd uh, love for you to... Uh, uh, give a little bit of uh, your your background and your your journey, so we can uh, get into the real meat. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, you did a good job of, of I think giving at least a high level for folks. Uh, you know, so I I started as a software engineering. I went to uh, a student at Auburn, uh, went and and started working for Google right out, and you know was privileged to be able to work on what wound up being a lot of the the core systems in uh, Google Cloud. The, the central resource hierarchy, the identity, uh, you know, and access management systems, the service management, service consumption systems. Um, and before that, I actually got to work in really classic enterprise uh, in for Colonial Pipeline Company. Uh, so it's kind of funny that I now get to write the security standards or, or help write security standards for the federal government, uh, you know, because a lot of that was actually spurred by the Colonial Pipeline uh, hack in, in the executive order that followed uh, a few years ago now. Um, you know, like you mentioned today, I, I work with Tetrate. Uh, we're really all about taking the service mesh to, to enterprise uh, and, and to really large, complex, uh, heavily regulated environments, you know, like the DOD, like financial, large financial institutions and similar. Um, and, you know, out of that, I get a lot of experience to, to help write a lot of these SPs that help inform uh, service security. Uh, the goal is hopefully, you know, these are... Um, a little bit more grounded and, and realistic and, and maybe a little bit more readable, uh, if, if, if you don't mind me saying, uh, than a lot of, of the SPs that, that we normally see. Uh, we tried to make them a lot more approachable and hands-on uh, than, than a lot of the guidance. Yeah, and they're also uh, moving at a faster pace. And, uh, you know, I think uh, they'll suddenly, you know, summarize to the point so we don't end up reading 500 pages for something that could be... Uh, uh, done in 20 right so that's good so exactly like all right exactly. so let's talk about zero trust a little bit you know we had a, a guest on the show uh two weeks ago actually about uh, uh zero trust and the, the debunking of what it is and obviously a lot of people have different opinions there uh what is your take on it what is what is yeah. zero trust yeah so i see i mean yeah I, we see so many different takes there's a ton of fud in this space right it's actually kind of frustrating uh as somebody that's like trying to maybe put do it the right way uh so what is the the right way and and what do i you know uh what do we see around zero trust when it comes to runtime so there yeah so first off there's a few different kind of places where zero trust comes up i would argue there's an entire pre-runtime activity the, the software supply chain, your GitOps, your, your Git processes, your code review, what does it take to produce an artifact? All of that is pre-runtime, really important. We're seeing the emphasis in, in industry today on you know, software bill material as one of the ways to grapple with, with parts of this problem. Um, where I spend most of my time is on the runtime. And I think this is maybe the, the most important part. You, you need to know that your binaries are good and, and coming to the right place. But uh, fundamentally, when it comes to the runtime, there's really five things, I would argue, that you need to be performing. And if you're doing these five things at every single hop in your infrastructure, not just at the perimeter, then I would argue that you've achieved a zero trust uh, you know, posture. And those five things are, one, you need encryption in transit. Uh, so you need to, to make sure that people can't change the message or, or eavesdrop. 
Two, you need to be able to authenticate service identity. So what is the application that is communicating? Three, you want to be able to authorize on that. So it's not good enough that it's just that you have an application identity. It needs to be authenticatable at runtime, and we need to be able to use that to apply policy. Then four, we need end user authentication. So we need to know not just what is the application that's in, that's doing the communication, but who's the user in session, right? Maybe one way to think about this is, you know, it's not good enough to know that the Twitter app is on the iPhone. We need to know that Nick is the one that's tweeting, right, is, is maybe the way to think about that. And then, you know, the, the fifth thing is that end user action. So authorizing the end user action at every hop along the way. And note that that may be a different action. That, you know, on the front end, there's one action, but that translates to a different action on the back end, which translates to yet a third action on the database. And at every hop, we need to ensure that that, that is authorized to occur. So those five things, encryption, service authentication and authorization, end user authentication and authorization. And if you're not doing those, then you're probably not in a zero trust posture. Micro segmentation doesn't do that. No single product probably today does all five of those as well. So you're looking at assembling a, a, a set of different pieces together to achieve that capability. Uh, certainly, obviously, you know, I'm, you can probably tell I'm a little biased coming from the service mesh side. So the service mesh provides strong capabilities to do at least four of those five with extensibility to be able to do end user authorization as well. Um, but, you know, we need all five of those to happen every single hop not just at the front door. Yeah, and I guess I have my couple of like, extra ones that I, I like to think about. I don't know what you think about the, the device enforcement piece, but uh, you know, for us in DD, yeah. obviously very important to to know you know the device identity being used and uh, see 100%. who is behind it, like you said. But what, what, what's your take on the device piece, I guess? Yeah, that's critical. So I kind of hand waved and said service identity. But if we dig into right. service identity, that's really gets to the heart. There's two things that you want to be able to check when you issue a service identity. One is, you know, what's the application that's executing? And two is what is the environment in which it is executing, right? That device. So is the device trusted? Is it, uh, uh, you know, is it a machine that's on the DoD network in a in a you know secure facility somewhere, or is it a cell phone that, that somebody has out in the world? Is it coming from China or Russia? Is it coming from the US? We want to be able to do all of those things to make a risk-based assessment when we issue the credential. And hopefully we're using that to scope then the privilege in the system. So you know, maybe you do get privileged to, to log in from Europe or from Russia. But certainly you can't write anything and maybe you can't read nearly as much, right? Device identity and that authenticating where an application is executing is a critical piece of that. Yeah, and you know, the, I was at a great meeting with the, uh, the DoD CIO uh, Zero Trust team and they've been working on <clears throat> this great publication that's gonna come out on Tuesday, by the way, people need to uh, uh, check it out, <clears throat> um, which will, be listing the 150 something uh, key pieces of a puzzle to be able to get to their target zero trust architecture. Obviously, you awesome. know, there's a lot of things, you know, I think it's always a little bit bloated. That's okay. Right. Um, they have seam and so, and, you know, a lot of different things, right. That's uh, to, to me, I guess uh, what, what it starts to look like is your entire cyber posture now is like zero trust. Right. So uh, it's always a struggle for teams. I find that, uh, uh, it's so bloated nowadays that uh, effectively you're telling people to do zero trust. You have to do all these cyber posture things that you're supposed to be doing anyways. You mentioned you know, the S bomb stuff, but of course there is continuous monitoring pieces uh, in logging, yep. centralized yep. logging telemetry, right? All these things, right? Seam, so and, and whatever else. Uh, I guess how do you make sure that uh, is that is that with your five thing that you say hey that's that's the binary I guess of zero trust versus a bloated uh, zero trust uh, uh, strategy. Exactly. So to your point, you know, there's a lot of other pieces that five is really the runtime. So SBOM and how do we get a, a binary and all that stuff is important and does need to be addressed. Right? Now, is that essential for zero trust or not? I would argue even if you have a, a legacy perimeter based security model, and you're happy with that for your business, you've done the risk, you know, you, you understand the risks involved. 
that software supply chain and software security and, and the, the CICD pipelines and all of that is still valuable. Right. So I view those as two categories. So right. having the, the assurance in the software that is running is important and critical regardless of your security model. Then when we're adopting zero trust itself, we can focus on a lot narrower set of things at, at runtime. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know, even those 150, I'm sure include things like inventory and, and there's a lot of other things yes. besides that goes into understanding your overall security posture. Right. Right. They're important from a runtime perspective though, at minimum, you need to be doing those five things. And if you're not, like, you know, if you're doing those things and you're probably a zero trust, but maybe not. Uh, but if you're not doing those things, then I can almost assuredly say you're not. <laughs> right. I guess, do, do you recommend people to maybe rename, uh, instead of calling this a, a zero trust, <laughs> you know, strategy? Is it more like a, a modern cyber architecture strategy that's, you know, instead of making yeah. zero trust bloated? Yeah, exactly. That's the, you know, I, I actually hate the name zero trust in general. I think it's actually a, a giant misnomer. <laughs> uh, it, it is correct that you don't trust the network, but instead I would argue that the entire communication is trustful rather than being network oriented, which is, which there is nothing to trust, right? We're instead using PKI and, and those established cryptographic primitives as our basis for establishing trust. Uh, so yeah, I think, you know, in general, zero trust specifically as a term is is over bloated and then we you know what it becomes to government or what it becomes to these other large organizations is yet again a different animal and that's why i really try and pare it down to five really simple things that like any engineer any developer any manager can understand uh to to be able to take and, and go did i implement these five things or not did i didn't there's got to be some gap somewhere that, that I did. Is, like is, there, is, is there a single document for them to go and get that list and be able to really understand what it means? Because, you know, obviously terms can be interpreted in different ways. What's the yeah. best way for people to do that? Yeah. So today there is not a single authoritative one. There's a couple of different guidance documents from different agencies. CISA has a, a cloud native uh, or a cloud security architecture uh, document, for example, that covers a lot of the essentials of zero trust as well. Um, DISA has some guidance in this as well. So there's a few different places. One of the ones we're going to talk about in, in a little bit later in the show is an upcoming 207A, uh, where hopefully those five that I just described to you, I, we will codify in the SP as like <laughs> a real simple litmus test. Uh, right. Today, there's, there's a gap and it's spread out. And that's why, you know, shows like this are super important, uh, you know, is, is, and, Larry, that, that's exactly right. Zero implicit trust, I think, is exactly the right thing. We're really making the trust in the system explicit. Uh, that's that's spot on. Right, right. Uh, all right. So I guess the question on the uh, from the audience on Twitter, I can bring it up on the screen, but I'm just going to read it to you. Um, you know, you mentioned encryption, right? Uh, we had a, a lot of great discussion on the show about quantum uh, uh, risk and you know the new generation of uh, of crypto. Obviously, there's different impact b b between symmetric and asymmetric uh, crypto. Yeah. Is there any concern for you when it comes to obviously, uh, uh, you know, service mesh in general with uh, with quantum uh, risks coming from uh, you know this new uh, wave of uh, uh, ideally quantum proof uh, crypto? Yeah. So you know, I guess there's a couple of different things to to pick apart here. Right. So, you know, from my perspective, I am not any more or less worried than anybody else that has to run something that doesn't encryption. Right. So we're going to the, the general philosophy from the service mesh world is that we're going to continue to build the software using the best known available cryptography in industry. Right. right. Uh, today, we base the, the FIPS distributions of Istio, the Tetrate builds on boring SSO, which is, you know, right. widely deployed very well understood it's, yeah, it's from in google right MVP database exactly yeah google it's the it's the google ssl libraries right um as and when the standard shift to include quantum cryptography and, and concerns there and you know i'll note that nist is like actively running competitions right now on quantum uh, cryptography so as those evolve those will be included in that software and the, the service mesh will have the ability to use hardened algorithms, right? And I guess, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. 
Uh, I guess back to Kili's comment here with everything as code. How important is you know policy as code when it comes to uh, the management of the settings of the mesh? It's it's key. It's key. Like I I would argue you know that everything as code is exactly right, and we want policy as part of that as well, right? And when we talk about policy, by the way, it's not just security, but the traffic management, the the observability capabilities, traffic routing, and and failover. In addition to access control, do I allow or deny this? Those are all types of policy that the mesh can implement. We want that to be code for all the reasons you want everything else to be code. It should be, it's, it's declarative configuration. We did a bunch of work to make it declarative. You want that source of truth to be able to go and understand what the ground truth should be. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. So now we talked a little bit about, um, you know, next generation access control. Uh, yeah. What is it exactly? And can you describe it to the audience? So this is actually where you, you mentioned, and, and we talked a little bit about, I, I write SPs with NIST. Uh, actually, my relationship with NIST started in researching access control. Um, I, I also mentioned, you know, I worked on GCP's identity and access management as well. So when it comes to uh, access control in industry, ABAC, uh, attribute-based access control, is the, the gold standard. Um, you know, for folks coming from the cloud native world, uh, you're probably familiar with stuff like Kubernetes RBAC. You know, RBAC is a phenomenally powerful system, um, but it has well-known limitations. ABAC is an extension or, or a, another formulation of access control that's fundamentally more powerful, uh, but with power comes responsibility, right? Uh, and so RBAC is a very tightly defined system. ABAC, you can make the rules. The problem is you have to enforce the rules. Uh, and enforcing those rules is very challenging in practice. Next generation access control is trying to kind of be a best of both worlds, if, you, if, if those are the two worlds. Uh, the idea is we want to be able to express any kind of policy. We want to be able to write anything that we could write with an ABAC, like XACML. We should be able to write with next generation access control in GAC. But there is, uh, we want some bounds. We don't want it to just be the wild west of you can put attributes anywhere and, and policy works on a set of attributes and, and you hope that you got it right. And so what next generation access control does fundamentally is move to a graph based model for, for modeling the underlying access control. A ABAC is traditionally formulated as a set. And it brings us it's some rules along with it. And so it has some rules on how the different parts of the system can relate. The net net of this is that we get an access control system that performs faster than traditional ABAX. It has the capability to explain and audit accesses. So I can tell you that, you know, Nick was able to, to hit the, the record button uh, in StreamYard because he's a member of this group and that group has this entitlement on, you know, this container and that container, you know, and, and this show is a member of that container, right? And so we can walk through the set of policies and the set of containers for objects and for users to explain and understand in human readable terms why an access is allowed. So fundamentally, this is super exciting. Uh, it's, it's really hard to understand access control policy at scale. So having tools inherent in the system to do this Big win. The other big win is that fundamentally we want to do what I just described when I when we talk about zero trust. We want to do authorization of the services communicating and the user to resource or the user action in the system. When we talk about service communication, that's fundamentally a graph. It really makes the access control policy in the system a lot easier to be able to model a graph in a graph. Right, We're, we, we have an access control system that's graph-based. We have a real-world access uh, problem that's inherently a graph. It fits very well. So not only does NGAC provide a lot of really awesome capabilities, but it fits the problem domain that we are trying to solve very well. Uh, and so it's a really powerful tool. Uh, I firmly believe, and, and uh, you know, by the way, Dr. Ferriolo, who created it over at NIST, uh, is famous for having created RBAC. Uh, he is the guy, if you go read the RBAC paper, you go read the RBAC book, author number one is, is David Ferriolo. Um, he also helped create ABAC. 
And so NGAC is kind of his magnum opus. It's his, it's his final kind of contribution to, to society at large before he retires with the express goal of, of beating out and sunsetting all the existing uh, ABAX because it's just a better way to do it. Yeah. And definitely with him, you know, being involved in this is kind of the next generation. <laughs> that's the name, in fact, <laughs> of uh, all back. Right. And, uh, you know, exactly. I guess that's why it's called the next generation X control. Uh, but it's he's such an exceptional person. Right. That's done so much for the nation and, and security as a whole. And he's, he's he such a, a great person. So uh, I'm excited that uh, we have the two of you to make sure we come up with uh, something that's going to make sense. Right. So. So I guess, <laughs> you know, next next generation X control. Do you? So I know when we talked about it last time, right? Uh, you were still writing a lot of it and, and kind of creating yeah, the yeah. the right implementation strategy. And I, I know you've been working on on pilots and trying to finally you know put this in in uh, yeah, in, yeah. in real deployments, right? Yeah, we're actually yeah. super excited now. Uh, this latest release of our product actually finally uses NGAC in the service data path. So we've actually been using NGAC for years to do uh, to implement an identity and access management system very similar to GCP with a hierarchy, with permissions, with inheritance down the hierarchy, really sophisticated stuff. And so we've been using that to harden next generation access control and, and build the engine, build the core APIs and, and, you know, ensure that it's actually functioning. We're actually just now moving from having it on the management side, you know, user access to pushing it into the service data path so that every single request goes through an NGAC decision point. Um, we're, we're super excited about this. We've seen really, really good preliminary results. The reason or the use case, and I'll give this as a teaser, this will be a following NIST SP uh, or, or at least a white paper that'll come out, not 207A, but, but a little bit later. One of the reasons we are putting NGAC in request path is to allow for higher level identities. So right now, uh, if we think about you know writing certain identity-based policy, that's a big thrust of zero trust. We're writing really, really primitive identity-based policy. In fact, I, I compare it, and in all the time, I compare the service mesh back to the legacy generation of networking. Uh, and so if we look at the, the things that we built at L3, L4, the service mesh is rebuilding a lot of those at the application layer but for the application layer. So it's not a re-implementation, but it's a, it's a leveling up. And so right. if we think about network policy and IP policy, how did, what did it look like? Originally, we wrote like policy with IP addresses and with ciders, right? <laughs> and, and we up-leveled into talking about subnets, but and eventually we, we up-leveled into label-based uh, uh, network flows, right? And right. we use label-based policy to control ABAC, fundamentally, label, a label-based policy is an ABAC we use to, to control network traffic. Today, when it comes to identity-based policy, we are writing IP addresses and ciders, right? Like we're writing individual service account names. One of the things that will happen in the next you know, two or three years is that we're going to up-level that to be higher level groupings. Um, so the reason NGAC understands the notion of a service and even units above a service like a workspace that's owned by a team that has many services. We allow those to be used as a principle in a policy rather than like a runtime surface account name. This even further enables a policy to move across environments because it moves with your notion of a service not just with your notion of even that service's single runtime identity. Well, saying, so you yeah. can have, yeah, so I can have it in AWS and in GCP, and they right. can have two different runtime identities in that place, but one policy that says front end can call back end. So, um, yeah, to answer Douglas, I guess it's completely independent to the, the infrastructure exactly. and the, it could be on premise, exactly. could be a gap, could be disconnected. It doesn't even have to be on a cloud. In fact, it could be uh, anywhere. Hey, Exactly. So if you think of like the, the GCP or AWS access control systems, they are attribute based access control systems that look like RBAC. You create a role, you assign that role to users. Under the hood, they're an ABAC. Think of NGAC as another way that Google or Amazon could implement their identity and access management systems. Right. So that's the, the level to think about it at. There are companies we're working on it. There's other folks that are working on the commercialization of NGAC. 
Uh, for us, it's a longer term thing because we're focusing on the service mesh right now. Um, so you will see MGAC start to appear more and more over time. Think of it in the same way that you think about RBAC. So it's like a, it's a way for you to express policy. So I guess, you know, a lot of people were asking what the difference between RBAC and ABAC and LBAC, right? Because a lot of people use these different terms. Yeah. Roles obviously yeah. assigned to users, labels can be assigned to data users and whatever. Uh, what's yeah. the difference with attributes? Attributes could be labels. I mean, so, so what really, exactly. how do you explain it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think of it like this. So attribute-based access control is kind of the granddaddy. It is the most expressive thing. So if we think about it from a mathematics perspective, because fundamentally ma uh, access control is, is an applied math. Um, and so, you know, we think about the instantiations and the engineering project of building NGAC, but understanding NGAC itself is fundamentally applied math. So when we look at it and, and uh, there's a couple different pieces that are essential to understand like how it's different from RBAC and, and ABAC. RBAC itself uh, defines, it is set based and it defines three primitives. It <laughs> defines a primitive, I apologize, the puppy as working at the mailman. You have a cute puppy, uh, so that's okay. Yeah. Uh, it defines a role. What is the set of actions that a user can take? And then you bind that to a resource. So users' resources get bound to a thing, right? ABAC is the granddaddy. It can express anything. So any RBAC policy that I write can be modeled as a set of attributes. Uh, one second. Let me, I apologize. Let me let's pick okay. up. I'll be right back. I apologize. Nick. No problem. Go ahead. So I'll take a question that uh, someone asked here. Um, let's see. Nick, can you expand on your concept of pace of relevance? I guess what's important for me when it comes to the pace of relevance is to say, hey, you know, um, how do you compete in a world of, uh, uh, of speed and, and baked in security and things like that? And uh, that's really where uh, we need to think of not only the velocity, but also what kind of te technical debt do you get? You know, what kind of... Uh, um, impediment you have to your velocity it could be security driven it could be a lot of different things so we think of it as as kind of this uh, a critical foundation where you cannot build software in a vacuum you have to use that sec up in security and things like that and that's what enables you to move at a pace of relevance and the pace of relevance is effectively what is um, the difference between being in business or getting slowly behind and a lot of technical debt and at some point having to stop work to take tackle that technical debt or just effectively go out of business, right? So, and you're back. So here we go. I took yeah. a little question. <laughs> sorry about that. Mentioned. So no, no, uh, that, again, that. sorry, fundamental question was, you know, what about ABAC, RBAC, NGAC? What are they different? How are they the same? Um, so I guess, how do, you, do, 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 how do you separate? Because I have a tough time separating ABAC and LBAC. Yeah, yeah. So any, so think of ABAC as the most powerful one. So any access control system that you could choose, you can implement with ABAC. Hmm. So it's super powerful, but with, you know, and again, and again, that's why it can be unwieldy and hard to use, right? RBAC, when we think about RBAC itself, it's a much more constrained problem. So with RBAC, rather than being able to assign any kind of attribute or label to any kind of user, Instead, we restrict what can be done and we say, hey, there's a predefined set of nouns that a user can have. So rather than saying I can assign any set of attributes I want and then I'm going to write a policy that targets, you know, three or five attributes. Instead, in RBAC, we say, hey, there can only be a doctor and a nurse. But what about and labels? I guess my, my bigger question is what about labels, L LBAC? And a back yeah. that's the one i basically the same thing they're okay. basically there's there at least as far as i'm I, i'm sure that there might be some technical distinctions between the two from a language and spec perspective there's a small difference when right. we talk about but how you conceptually concept. think about it it's the same an attribute yeah. is just a label a label is just an attribute right um so i wasn't completely so crazy. That, that's yeah exactly that's how, that's the easiest again there's some nuance in the in the details but at a high level, just think about it in terms of, you know, labels are attributes and, you know, it, it, yeah, it's roles are more like single or, you know, you can't, usually you don't have more than a couple of roles at best or exactly. it's not like labels exactly. where you can have more granular labels and very precise things. Right. So, 
Exactly. And that actually gets at the fundamental heart of the expressivity. That limit of you only have a few things in our back is the reason that it's so successful. It's really easy to understand mentally. Like I can right. just, I can read a set of policies and I can picture, I can imagine successfully most of the time what access is or is not allowed by the system. When you get to a label-based access control or an ABAC, it's much harder to understand what is or is not allowed by a policy change. In fact, didn't you have uh, some work on the explainability of, of labels and and uh, exactly. showing that visually? Is that a, a piece of the puzzle there? Ex it, that's exactly it. So that, that again gets to the kind of uh, fundamental math side. So the math that underpins these systems R back and A back is based on set theoretics. And the thing with a set is that it's flat. There's no notion of causality or, or right. necessarily a relationship between them. Whereas a graph is, it can be built from sets, but a graph has a notion of causality. I have these edges that link things that imply some, some direction or movement. And so using those edges, we can walk through the graph. And basically when we're making an access control decision, can a user act on an object? We're gonna walk the graph from the user to the object and we're gonna gather some permissions along the way. And again, I'm being very high level here, but, uh, and, and those permissions then are the actions that you can take. But those paths through the graph describe user understandable policy. Right. They right. say, hey, Nick is Nick is a user and Nick is a member of the admin group and the admin group has a policy that gives right permission to this uh, project and your resources in that project. Yeah, that's, so it's a like a, that's the whole that of a graph, of graph, right? Showing the relationships and the which is tough to comprehend. Right. If you have a lot of cross pollinating exactly. things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so you can show that graph to a user or you can give out a text description like I just described to you and right. the user can, can use that to understand. One of the other big capabilities is that we can do that ahead of time. So I can say, this is what it would be if you were to apply this right, policy. If you give that, that label, that's the, yeah, the impact. Yeah. And so you can, exactly. So you can do impact analysis, exactly. You know, funny enough, uh, maybe five, six years ago, I saw the company that was doing graphs in cyber to be able to show hidden relationships between like someone signing a contract and a partnership agreement and then also, you know, being responsible for the, you know, cyber assessment. And oh, you also have, you know, all these findings and CVs and things. And you will see like relationship between companies, oh, you know, offices, cool. clouds. It will show you like hidden relationships. And yeah. so I saw this thing and. It was, you know, at the time pretty unique because the graphs, you know, you couldn't really handle massive volumes. And uh, we were the first to use at the time Neo4j, you know, to get oh, that's awesome. to that kind of volume, you know. So that's I awesome. understand oh, the here. concept of relationships. You know, that was a nightmare in my life for, for a year. So I bet, I bet. No, that's all. And, you know, just actually, by the way, you might want to revive that company or, you know, spin out another one. I, know, uh, right? I expect <laughs> that the exact same thing is going to happen for SBOM. So right. it's going to be important for us to understand the graph of software dependencies right. and software libraries Licenses. that we depend on. Because there's, yep. there's linchpin pieces, right? So like if, for example, the service meshes were successful in becoming a modern security runtime, then that means that Envoy, the proxy that we use to implement all the, the policy enforcement and encryption and similar, that's a linchpin security component for a large part of the ecosystem. You know, a more yeah. obvious example is OpenSSL <laughs> is, is yeah. a linchpin security project for the entire world, right? Right. I think as we dig into SBOM and, and SBOM matures and tooling comes into existence that does some of that graph analysis, we're going to see some like pretty disturbing things, uh, I think. Uh, in, oh, yeah. in, I say that with a smile, but, you know, like I expect <laughs> that, you know, we're going we're gonna to see some things that we look at and we go, wow, that's really not sustainable as an industry. Um, oh, yeah. Or, hey, we need better investment. Uh, so I think that'll be a, an interesting outcome of, of, of SBOM maturing, that kind of graph-based analysis. Yeah, I've, I've asked so many companies and products now, first with the Air Force and even after helping companies try to do business with DoD, I, I, I was still surprised, even with pretty well-known startups, you know, pretty good teams, they had dependencies that were older than the company. 
you yep. Know? Yep. And I'm like, exactly. how, how did you pick a version that's actually older than when the company was founded? Like how, and these yep. new versions, right? And I'm like, how did that happen? Like, how did you get stuck on that? that exactly, version? exactly. And that's where we need, you know, just like we need better education around zero trust, this is an area where we need a lot more concerted education across the board for, for folks on, Developers. you know, managing dependencies and, and the importance of, them, of dependencies yeah. for security and, and updating them for some, for some reason they get stuck yeah. in time forever. Right. So that's, that's, yeah, really exactly. Yeah. You never update them. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, this is where, you know, things like on GitHub, uh, the security, the dependency scanners and, and some of those things that are being rolled out are, you know, awesome for community wide impact. Uh, in, in somewhere. So, you know, it's exciting to see as an industry we're, we're increasing the level of maturity there incrementally. Uh, I wish it would go a little bit faster, but but it is yeah. at least refreshing to see that, you know, we're kind of moving in the right direction, it, it feels like. What kind of technology are you using now for graphs? Is it, uh, is Neo4j still relevant or is there something better now? Yeah, so uh, we, we actually use a, a little bit of a homegrown thing uh, today for NGAC <laughs> for a variety of different reasons. Uh, I thought there was the, a bunch of open source things. things now. I guess. Yeah. What, no, no, sorry. I, I thought there was a bunch of open source capabilities nowadays. Is that there are so, uh, so Neo4j is so great. Uh, it, it would be the one to pick as we get into larger and larger data sets with NGAC. We will likely start to use uh, uh, Neo4j as our backing store. Uh, today, though, actually, we can get to really large enterprises. Uh, using a really simple in-memory graph database. We, mm. we uh, basically implement a set of adjacency lists and right. uh, NGAC graphs tend to be pretty sparse. Um, right. And so with an adjacency list, we actually get pretty good. Uh, we can actually fit like millions of records on a single pretty modest like lap developer laptop for testing kind right, of thing. Right. Um, so we have large scalability in the system to meet the needs today without needing to go all the way to a heavyweight graph database, which has yeah. different problems, like get a, get a license for a Neo4j license, clustering. You have to pay. Um, and, and those kinds of things, yeah. So for I, us, I got a few million nodes on, the, on Neo4j. It was, it was getting pretty slow. Uh, yep, exactly. So, there, you know, so there's a bunch of different trade-offs. You know, for us as well, there's some interesting kind of secret sauce and special things we want to be able to do. Uh, with the graph that we can't really do with Neo4j. What I mean by that is, you know, we have the service mesh, we have sidecars to do enforcement. Uh, I would like to be able to do enforcement locally uh, in the sidecar and, and render decisions mm. there to the extent possible. It doesn't really make sense for you to put Neo4j on the sidecar yeah. on a simple no. memory graph database we can. Um, so that's what we use today for, for practicality. In, rea in the long term, the system will likely be a, a, a mix where you'll have Neo4j or some other kind of source of truth backing database with enforcement right. happening with decisions happening locally in the proxy as well. Interesting. All right. Very cool. So I guess let's talk about the uh, Nest 204 series, right? Uh, tell yeah. us uh, first, for people that don't know the 204 series, tell us a little bit about the 204 series and uh, what have you. And I have a link here at the, the bottom of the screen where you did a great blog on the T-Trait <coughs> website. So if people Google uh, uh, Google uh, T-Trait um, NIST standard for zero trust, you're gonna come up with that that page here. Um, tell us first about the the, the, the 204 and then what, you're, what you've been working on. Yeah, so the 204 series, so just I, uh, to back up one, so for when NIST itself, they produce special publications that, that are, you know, recommendations that are binding in the Department of Commerce and used by the rest of the government and industry as, as authoritative standards. Uh, there's a bunch of different series there. 207 is one that a lot of people are familiar with. That's what defines zero trust. Uh, 853 is the one that everybody has to implement for FedRAMP. Uh, <laughs> 204. And, the, and not just FedRAMP, but all, all FISMA and, and, and control. Yeah, like 50, yeah, 853 is the granddaddy. It's the, it's the, it's the big one. All the controls. Um, exactly. All the big controls. 1180, uh, 1189 of them last time I counted. Yeah. Um, 204 is the set of standards for microservice security. Uh, so full stop. Right now, there are four entries in that series. There's 204 itself which is a very high level document that outlines uh, about 13 different strategies around microservice security. 204A is the first one that I helped author. 
and it gets more specific and it's really laying out the groundwork for a secure service mesh deployment. 204B, excuse me, and then builds on that to talk about using that secure service mesh deployment to secure applications running on the mesh. Right, so we had to kind of build up. So deploy a secure mesh itself, then use that security property to secure applications running on top of the mesh. And so 204A describes a variety of security properties that, that the mesh can, can provide. And it also talks about, although it doesn't directly say those five things that I call zero trust, it exactly talks about how the service mesh can be used for encryption, for service authentication and authorization, and end user authentication as well. Uh, and so we directly speak to those. And we even talk about actually the relevance of NGAC in modeling the graph access and, and using it for access control. 204C itself is the last uh, entry in the series today. Uh, and it is specifically about the pre-runtime activities uh, and about the SecOps pipelines. Uh, and so it's about, you know, secure uh, CICD pipelines and, and similar. All right. I think I helped on that one. I forgot which one. Yeah, you did. Yeah, we uh, there. Yeah. A lot of your stuff definitely fed into it. As, <laughs> as, uh, I forgot. You know, Too many numbers. Too many numbers. Yeah, exactly. Um, so 204C exactly was based on platform one and a lot of the work that you spearheaded as part of the, the DSOP. What's coming up uh, next is is a couple different ones. Uh, you mentioned pace of innovation is, is going up. Uh, at the same time, the pace of standardization here is going up as well. Uh, I'm actually pretty proud. I think the 204 series is maybe about five years ahead of time compared to when NIST typically standardizes around uh, a set of technologies. Um, right. So I'm really proud that, that we are relevant in a timely place uh, yep. as the federal government is adopting, it, it's already there. What's coming up next then is another probably three to four SPs in the next year or so. So quite a lot is coming and it'll be coming in two different series. Uh, so the first one that I am really excited about, I kind of view 204 has been setting the groundwork. We've been kind of defining the baseline and now in this next 2023, we're going to start to come out with some SPs that really kind of do cool stuff. Now, basically, they <laughs> use the groundwork that we've laid to really talk about how can we move to a zero trust environment you know, architecture? How can we enable these? You know. So to that end, 207A will be coming out next year. It is exactly about transitioning from a traditional perimeter-based security model to an identity-based posture. And we're going to specifically talk about some patterns that we see used in the wild to do things like deploy an identity aware proxy on either side of the DMZ when I want to facilitate, for example, communication from cloud back to on prem. And we can have a static set of firewall rules that allow these two sets of pools of proxies to communicate. And then we can apply, you know, application level identity based policy for who can go over the tunnel. The advantage in a world like that is that we still maintain a, our perimeter security model with the DMZ, but we've made the policies there static rather than having to change them every time an app wants to consume some, a different SaaS on cloud or, or a new app gets deployed that needs to call back to the database on prem. And instead, when those new things happen, we write an identity-based policy in the service mesh that's much easier to understand, that's much faster to author, that we have those you know, MGAC techniques to understand the impact of the policy change and similar, so that we can have confidence to make the changes more quickly. So that's what 207A will, will discuss, is this, this migration from a perimeter-based model to uh, an identity-based model and some example you know, uh, reference architectures that we'll look at for how you do that migration. Then following on, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that kind of needs to be addressed in the periphery. One of the things that we're going to address is that notion of identity that I talked about earlier. You know, today we're writing, you know, service account oriented, like individual runtime identity, IP based effectively, you know, the equivalent policies. We want to up level the policies. We'll have a white paper from this that describes, you know, why we want to do that and, and what good looks like. 
will additionally have some uh, follow on, uh, probably another white paper or, or uh, you know, recommendation at least around the service mesh sidecar deployment. I think that's one of the topics we'll talk about in a little bit here, Nick. Um, but we'll talk about EVPF and sidecar and ambient and, and all of those. We're going to write up some some formal analysis of the security trade-offs of those deployment options and some guidance on where you might want to pick when, uh, which when. Um, and then finally, there will be a, a 204D is, is likely to, to follow on as well, continuing to build out some of the runtime controls that the service mesh can provide for applications. Um, so it's, it'll be a pretty packed uh, year, I think, with, with quite a few SPs coming out. Hopefully, all of these are really short, concise, and, and pretty easy to read. 207A, you know, we're really hoping will clock in at, at about 15 pages. Um, you know, so really short and concise compared to, you know, 853 that's, a, you know, 400-page document, something <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah, lots of controls, of course. But uh, so I, I guess, you know, a lot of the, the discussion around, you know, zero trust with companies, they are arguing that... Uh, it's mostly about identities, right? So a lot of people that do identity yeah. proxies and stuff like that argue they have a full-fledged, you know, zero trust product. You know, we we talked about your five pillars of, of zero trust. You know, yeah. one of my important stuff that I always talk about is micro segmentation, right? And yeah, secure defined sure. parameter and, and, you know, kind of um, removing the ability of a malicious actor to scan the network, to see what's there and have a dedicated, you know, segment of one to only be able to see what's, what they're supposed to see based on the device they 100%. use. The identity they have and the component risk of those uh, uh, two factors that can be continuously reassessed along the way. So you you can continuously mm -hmm. assess the state of the device, patching state, and and you know malware and other stuff, and and the user identity as well. So what's your take when it comes to micro segmentation? I don't think Nest has done a good yeah. job yet to define what the software defined. You know, we talk about software defined networking, but not really software yeah. software defined parameter. So what's your take on the SDP slash uh, you know? micro segmentation side of things. Do we not talk enough about it? Yeah, so I view it as a pretty important defense in depth. Uh, I think in general, it's probably not talked about en enough about. Um, however, we still want to, like the general pattern or strategy that we've seen, or at least that I have seen, has been relaxing those controls in favor of identity-based controls. So right. the idea is we want to reach a steady state where we have the defense in depth. To your point, you don't want somebody, just because you have authentication and authorization at every hop, doesn't mean somebody should be able to, to map your entire infrastructure with port scanning right. because it's all internet facing, right? right? So 100%, you, you still want these perimeter controls. From my perspective, the important thing is balancing them to be able to maintain agility. Right. Because that's really the, the problem that we see is not that those controls are not good or, or people want them, but keeping them up to date, keeping them accurate is challenging. Understanding why those rules exist is challenging. And so then they become brittle and slow and, and kill each other. So I think they're important. I think we need to talk more about how you can do better practices around layering in that way. The other thing is I think there's some technology that needs to happen. So right now there's a huge number of duplicate policies that exist in the stack. Um, so if you think about, for example, like a, a two microservices calling each other um, that, that do those five checks that I described to you. So that's five ACLs, five policy decisions that, that we applied, right? So we encrypted it. We, we authenticated and authorized at, at both levels. But there was also quite a few network ACLs that we went through. Right. So we, we did have some VPNing, some subnetting, some something there. There might even be some firewall ACLs and, and similar that we went through. Uh, there's there's a bunch of different policy at, at different layers. From a technology perspective, I believe what is needed is a little bit of a higher level system or a higher level language to describe services that need to access each other. That should be instantiated at, by an, automatically by some machine at the service mesh layer, at the CNI or, or SDN layer, at the cloud provider VPC layer. At it, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's where I believe. Layer, yeah. Exactly, we should be able to express an intent 
there is, and, and actually, by the way, this is another interesting one. Uh, I think the way that we're expressing policy today is fundamentally wrong. We're, we're doing pairwise, like front end can call back end, back end can call database. What we really want to be able to say is there is a user action from the front end through the back end to the database that is exactly, you know, the update shopping cart. And that calls, you know, the put on this one and a, and a put on that one and a, a post to the database. That's a flow that I want to tackle. Or, or that I, sorry, let me rephrase. I want to create a policy that captures that flow and right. no other flow. And then I want to translate that into a discrete set of policies that the mesh can enforce. For example, hey, front end and it can call the, the back end. Back end can call the database and only on these methods. But the high level policy should describe this graph basically. Uh, and not even a full graph. It's actually in the telecommunications world, what's called a slice. Hmm. So this slice of end user exposed function through my system. And there's some ACL, you know, there's some permissioning that's involved there. And then, you know, in my opinion, that's the holy grail. That's the best possible policy that we could write. You know, not just finding a call back in the back end Google database, but this is the end user flow. And there's six of them for this set of applications, right? From that, we should instantiate a, a, a micro segmentation. We should in, instantiate a, a mesh based identity based policy and, and similar. We're not there yet today, but that's, in my opinion, where we need to go. <clears throat> Doesn't it get quite complex when you have a lot of microservices that do different things and you don't really have a good understanding of how to describe it, the, the whole flow, I yep. guess, because the flow might change? Yeah, yeah that's one of the reasons it's 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 not done, I won't say impossible today, but not done today, is because the rate of change is large and accelerating. And so what you actually need, I believe, to, to be able to do that successfully is tooling to feed back into your policy engine. So you right. need something like the service mesh that can observe real-time traffic in the system, use that to generate policies, have humans approve those policies and promote them into production. And that should happen in a continuous feedback cycle as the applications evolve. Interesting. Very cool. Um, and um, again, it's a tooling problem today. There's not that feedback loop there today around policy authorship because there's not a common policy enforcement point and common telemetry out of the system to be able to build that. You know, the service mesh starts to provide that. So we're. St I believe that, you know, in the next few years, we'll realize that as a system. Uh, and I say we, I, I think in general, industry is like getting to the point where all the pieces are in place that we can realize that. Yeah. I guess someone was asking on Twitter, uh, if, if you use a mesh and you don't have any other kind of cyber mechanisms, does the mesh prevent kind of the lateral movement in the sense of um, scanning, not, not, not talk, not maybe interacting, but scanning the network in terms of discovery? Uh, or you still need other mechanism, yeah. like you said, maybe submit, subnetting or whatever it is you're going to do. So there's a couple different things. So one, you know, you are depending on the non-bypassability of the sidecar there. So like if I can figure out as an attacker how to bypass the sidecar, then all that's wrong and you can do the scanning. Now, so let's let's take that out. So let's assume that you can't break out of the, the container, break out of the sidecar. Then there's really the, the question is, do you program your service mesh correctly? Uh, is maybe where I would put it, which by which I mean, you know, by default, when you install Istio, for example, and, and all other service meshes are the same as far as I'm aware, it sends total service discovery information everywhere, right? So in some sense, you can map the network because you could even just ask the proxy, what is all of your configuration? And it would tell you, you know, everything that exists in the network and where all the endpoints are. Or if you don't want to be proxy aware, you can just start sending requests and the proxy fundamentally has the configuration to be able to route to them. Now, hopefully right. you have an authorization policy in place that would reject it, but that still means that I can map your infrastructure. Right. right? Yeah, because you could so, still find it, right? You can still discover exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. So in a in what I would call a proper, properly configured service mesh, in addition to having authorization policy, you should scope the configuration that goes to any individual sidecar proxy instance such that it can only it only has the configuration to route to the set of services that the that 
you need to talk to. In other words, the configuration for what you can talk to should align with the authorization policy for who you can't, you're allowed to talk to. Right. Instead of having, knowing how to talk to anybody, but authorization policy says I can talk to this set, I should talk to this set and I should only know how to talk to that set. When we can do that successfully, then you've limited the space that an attacker can move laterally to only the intended backends that your service should be talking to. So there's still an element of discovery that's allowed, but it's contained. It's a smaller attack surface. Exactly, exactly. But but just to clarify, because there's a difference between discovering and being able to engage with the service, right? Yeah. And, you know, have a, some type of interaction, I guess. <laughs> exactly. With with a mesh, could you prevent, if, if you set it up right and you have the enforcement mode, you know, uh, on, can you prevent the discovery of non-whitelisted services? Yes. So they wouldn't even and be so, able to find out if it exists. Exactly. Uh, now, okay. again, that will depend on what instance you land on. So, you know, by in, so let me give you a concrete example. Tetrate Service Bridge uses Istio. That's our, our flagship product uses Istio. We program the discovery information in the sidecars based on your access policy. So the access policy is exactly the set of things who you are allowed to talk to. We use that to send the configuration so that you are only configured to discover those things. Mm -hmm. Now, when you compromise it, you can, let's say that the front end can call the back end. If I compromise the front end, I can discover the back end. Mm -hmm. But I cannot discover the database. Right. Right. And so that's the, so you can't sit on, it's not like you're getting a bastion and you can like network scan everything around you. Right. You can only pivot to the things that policy explicitly allows you to. So we've right. reduced the attack surface. We bound our attack in space to only the, the services that you're expecting that application to communicate with. That, by the way, is then why the, the super policy that I described that moves across multiple services is mm -hmm. so much more effective for bounding an attack in space because it's not just front-end can call back-end, but it's like only this method of the back-end and only from this spot in the front-end, you can right. start to just ratchet down that the space that an attacker can move in more and more effectively. By the way, sorry, one other piece here. That's why it's so important that you authenticate and authorize the end user credential in addition to the services. That's why all five are so essential. Is that it's, again, it's about bounding an attack in space and in time. So a service can talk to the back end. But if I additionally have a policy that says only in the presence of a valid end user credential with the read scope, right. then I've again narrowed the attack surface. So it's no longer sufficient to, to own my front end server. You also need to then own end user credentials in session that are valid and not expired. And they need to have the right scopes. Right. So now you need both of those to then pivot and attack the, the back end. So right. it becomes su substantially harder for an attacker because you're bound by application and end user identity and session. So you're bounding in time based on the expiry of those credentials. End users, that's typically 15 minutes. For service identity, that's typically an hour. Mm -hmm. So we get that double. So you have like 15 minutes to perpetrate a, a, an attack. Uh, before you need to re reseal a credential and you can only attack the back ends and not anything else, right? So it gets us into a much better state than, than you know, a lot of enterprises have today. Yeah, short-lived short -lived certificate, so important, right? Although people keep exactly. storing credentials in plan, plan tax in, uh, in Git, so that might not be a good idea to, to do that. Yeah, and in the Kube API server and somewhere, like, don't put your Kube, <laughs> don't put secrets in etcd, like, please use the secret, you know, use the storage interface. Uh, driver to load secrets securely. Like there's a bunch of easy foot guns that are in place to leak secret material in cloud native systems, right? So that's why a lot of those pre runtime checks are equally important for a zero trust posture as the five runtime checks, right? Uh, so it, you know you can't if if you're leaking secrets if you put the cert on GitHub then it doesn't matter what your, your what your posture is because I can act as your service, right? Like, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's why both are, 
both are essential. So I've been fighting for this for many years, uh, and finally it still was donated to the CNCF. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this was super, super exciting. Uh, you know, it's, it's many years overdue. Uh, you know, I think, Nick, you know, you and I both talked about it back in the day about how frustrating it was that Istio yep. wasn't on the CNCF. Um, so, you know, it finally is. So it, it's accepted as a, as a project in, uh, by the CNCF, uh, just like Kubernetes or Envoy or, or any of those other cloud native projects that you use. Uh, previously, the, the real change here is that the CNCF holds the trademarks. Whereas previously Google uh, held the trademarks, um, right. you know, so, uh, but you know, all the other stuff that comes along with being in the cloud, in the CNCF, Istio gets now as well. Um, so we're super excited. Uh, materially, probably the single biggest impact you'll see out of this uh, is one, that's the CYA. I kind of joke that the CNCF is the new IBM. Uh, nobody gets fired for, for installing cloud native technology. Um, so, you know, A, you have that check mark there for, for Istio itself. Um, but, you know, the, the more important thing is that it's finally in that neutral body so that I, I think we'll finally start to see kind of all the cloud players uh, come in and participate in the space. Uh, you know, I think basically that this unlocks Istio finally uh, becoming what Kubernetes was for container orchestrators, right? With, right? By which I mean kind of putting to rest the battle of like Mesosphere versus Kubernetes. You know, today we have Istio or Linkerd or Hashi or, you know, whatever one. I think that we will see over the next year convergence on Istio as the, it, it already is the industry standard for, for serious enterprise, but I think we'll see it converged on as the industry standard across the board. And what, what status is it in? Is it graduated or what? what's the status? No. Nope. So it, it entered just like any other project. So it, it entered as an incubating project. Uh, I do believe as it, like we already satisfy all the criteria for graduation. However, we have not yet applied for graduation yet. Um, hmm. You know, we, we do intend to. We're working with the CNCF uh, TOC for guidance on when and, and how to, to do that. Um, you know, I don't materially, I'm not sure how much of an impact that makes for decision makers or not. Well, you know, it, it, does. it's in it the does. CNCF. It does. Okay, it great. Does. Yeah. Well, so that is something we are actively. I, I hear a lot of right. 14500 say they don't, they don't do anything if it's not great, not in production, if it's not great, graduated, I guess. So. And one thing I will say, of course, is that, you know, Istio itself, uh, I, for, for decision makers that are watching, I know you have a bunch of the watch right. the, this, this show, Nick, uh, is, you know, Envoy itself is the thing that's actually doing all the policy enforcement that's handling the bits and bytes of the application traffic. That is an, a graduated project. That is a, a project right. that has tips, builds, and, and similar. So that's the thing that's really handling the I mean, Istio definitely the meet, uh, check all the boxes, so we should get it done. Exactly. Move on. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so is and so Envoy does Istio itself, the control plane that drives it will be. Uh hopefully, you know, so I all of that to say, you know, hopefully it'll be graduated in, in twenty twenty three. Um, you know, I don't know of any blockers that would prevent that from happening. Yeah, I doubt I doubt so. Uh and for people that don't know, Envoy is uh, the proxy used by Istio and Istio is kind of the control plane of the mesh. Exactly. So, all right. Let's see. Now I wanted to uh, in fact, I'm going to take a question here. Yeah, I was going to uh, say that's that's a perfect question. Yeah, how expensive would it be to implement uh, the a service mesh in a startup or any s small and medium company? Or does it make sense uh, for large? Only makes sense for large yeah. corporations. Yeah. So I I think that thinking about it in terms of company size is not quite the right dimension. Right. So the service mesh, the real capability or, or the real benefit that the service mesh brings is that it's a, a force multiplier. So really what I mean by that is it becomes an integration point that works horizontally across every application. So, you know, for example, and, and you know, this is regardless of if you're a small company or a large company, let's say that we want to move into a new market and we're subject to PCI or, or whatever other regulation, right? That, that means we need to up our, our security. So how are you going to go and implement, for example, encryption and transit that's required there? Do right. you go to every application and implement encryption? 
or do you bring in the service mesh and do it in one place? Yeah. Now we need to operationalize our, our applications. We need metrics, we need logging, we need tracing. Again, do you go to every application or do you do it one time in the mesh? And yeah. now we need to, to add in canaries and failover capabilities, retries and resiliency again, right? So the, yeah. the question oh, is oh, not I guess how any software intensive company, right? Uh, it's a no brainer to, to enable and scale their, their teams and have to not focus on building all this stuff in a vacuum, right? Exactly. It's really about, so, you know, for small and medium teams, I would say it can be a really effective force multiplier right. so that there's a whole litany of concerns you don't need to deal with. In practice, the most mature service mesh adoptions today are in large corporations. Right. That is because we're still early in the adoption curve and it's still hard. <laughs> and, you know, where there's a bunch of folks, Tetrate included, actively doing work to make service mesh adoption easier and cheaper. So the so that horizontal multiplier is most attractive the larger you get, right? If you have 10,000 applications, it's, it's intractable to add encryption and transit but if you have 10 you could right, right. and so certainly it may it the value proposition is bigger the larger you are but even for a small company with a small focus team there's a lot that you can offload and just don't do in your applications if you can have the mesh to it particularly if you care about security and zero trust and don't want to build the, all this tech debt right that's i think the biggest exactly. win for scale and you know, many exactly. teams, of course, could buy buy stuff as a service and uh, uh, avoid to build it in a vacuum and and leverage uh, you know past services, right? Yep, e exactly. And even when we're leveraging you know PaaS and and SaaS services and similar, we still have our core business applications that we got to run, we got to secure, and we have to manage how they communicate out to the SaaS, right? right. And so even there, uh, the the mesh provides a lot of value regardless of, of team size. So again, I, I don't want to, to sound overly rosy here. It's definitely an expensive thing to adopt. It is most beneficial for large organizations. But thinking about it as a function of size of deployment is wrong. Think about it in terms of people and the, and the horizontal multiplier. What is the effort of, of implementing X feature across every application in the portfolio? And what's the incremental cost of doing it every time you bring a new application versus doing it once? And what we see there is that is that, you know, at least in my opinion, it makes sense even for small folks to to start with a mesh or to, to begin to use one. Right, right. So I guess back to our question, how do how do you go after deploying the service mesh across a large organization? Yeah. So, um, you know, we start incrementally. So, so first off, it's never, it's not going to happen in a snap, right? It's a, it's a long process. It's incremental. What we recommend that we do is first inventory the set of applications uh, that, that the team is, is going to deal with, right? And that could be all the applications in the infrastructure, in the, in the organization. That could be a very small subset that are only going into Kubernetes, for example. Right. Then once we have our, our set and, you know, for most people, we like to I like to work with the entire set of applications in the in the input, not just scoop. We then bucket them. And there's a bunch of different criterion that we use for bucketing. There's a service mesh handbook that's on the, the Tetrate site. Uh, I think you maybe have to give us your email to get it in that. I have a three page checklist that I that I go over for what we do to onboard an application and how we bucket and some more. The high points are we're going to bucket by, you know, how the application communicates. Things that are HTTP go in one bucket. Things that are TCP go in one. Things that are UDP go in another. Then we're going to bucket, sub bucket by framework. Uh, and, and, you know, so things that are, you know, let's say, let's pick all the Java Spring Boot apps first. The, and the reason for this is they're going to have behavioral similarities. And then eventually we're going to narrow down that bucket. So we have a handful of applications there that are maybe... You know, and then we're going to start with the easiest of those. So let's pick, you know, already containerized, uh, you know, HTTP applications running in Kubernetes. And for most organizations, that's like a tiny, minuscule number of things that really aren't business impactful. But we can start there where it is easiest to deploy the mesh and demonstrate value. And then we start to move into harder buckets of applications. And when I say harder, I mean because they have more rigorous runtime 
capabilities. It's a more critical application. It has more stringent security or availability or, or reliability requirements. Um, or it only speaks TCP and it doesn't speak HTTP. So we're going to run down that list, onboarding applications and learning every time that we do. Because the goal for, for large organizations that, that you know I work with primarily is to build the blueprints and to build the happy path for development teams to come on and bring their, their applications. And so we can do that per type. We can, here's the happy path for Spring Boot. You know, you're taking a Spring Boot application off PCF that has Spring Cloud Gateway. You're moving it into Kubernetes and cloud. Uh, you know, it's already network oriented. It's already containerized. Here's the recipe. And now you have, you know, what was a Spring, you know, was a PCF app is now a, a, a Kubernetes service that, that you have the mesh to route with, for example. And then we go down to, to the next pool of applications. And so we work that, you know, in, in the way that you would expect. Kubernetes, containerized, web-oriented, down to TCP, UDP-oriented things, and then off of Kubernetes and into VMs, into bare metal deployments, into, uh, you know, uh, uh, DMZ deployments and, and similar. Uh, so we kind of move from the easy part out to the edges of the system and from the easy applications into the harder ones. Interesting. And what about legacy, I guess? Um, by legacy, I mean, you know, real legacy, like 60-year-old, you know, SCADA systems, or can you, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or maybe just also, you know, non kubernetes centric universes uh, still running yeah. on, uh, you know, on-premise vSphere or, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, so we do see, so that's one of the key things that, that you know, Tetrate actually has extended the service mesh to do. Uh, we have, you know, customers with large footprints in vSphere in uh, somewhere, you know, I, when you work with financials in the DOD, uh, if Kubernetes suddenly stopped existing, right, if every single kube cluster shut down, most people wouldn't care, right? And what I mean by that is the critical systems aren't there yet. And so if that's the only place that you're providing value, it's not good enough. Um, and so for us, it's essential that you be that you are able to go back to VMs, that you're able to go back to legacy hardware. And for things that you can't literally put a, a, a sidecar behind or, or in front of, there's a variety of other techniques that we have, whether that's deploying an egress proxy in front of that uh, you know, network appliance that can apply policy on behalf of the service mesh, uh, or just modeling it as an external service that, that we route traffic to. There's a lot of techniques that we have kind of in our toolbox for integrating existing systems with a sidecar, without a sidecar, and incrementally getting visibility and policy control. So is it like more like a proxy setup then, and you put something in front of it? Or how does this work? Yeah, that's one of the techniques for it, for sure. So we see, you know, so one, we see deploying a sidecar on the bare metal on the VM. That's one option. You know, the second option is a traditional kind of reverse proxy deployment uh, right. where that Envoy middle proxy can apply policy. A third one is, uh, you know, what you might think of as like a squid egress proxy deployment, right? Where we can apply policy as the request goes out the door. Right. Interesting. So uh, I guess Joseph here had a question. Um, yeah. Linkerd Link wasn't really hard to set up pretty easy. Is this too much harder? What does the pain come in? And is the pain yeah. getting into getting it into Kubernetes to begin with? I, I think the other piece is, is also, yeah. um, you know, it's not just the setup and it's, it's how you set it up and the enforcement mode and white listing of resources. And I think it's pretty easy exactly. to install day, day one or any, any mesh, but then yeah. doing it right is a whole other story. In fact, Linkerd at That's the beginning exactly did not right. even have the enforcement mode for a very long time. So that wasn't even an option. So Exactly. So Linkerd, so like, like, yeah, so let's level set here. There's a couple different things to tease out. So where does the pain come in? 100% a lot of the pain that users experience is just, I'm new to Kubernetes and I'm doing service mesh at the same time and it's all really hard. So <laughs> that's yeah. definitely part of it, right? However, to your point, like Linkerd actually does quite a few things to optimize the day zero install setup experience over Istio. Um, and there's a variety of different reasons for that. They, they pick a different, easier set of defaults to be able to bring to the, to the table. Uh, they didn't do encryption for a long time. They do do that now. 
you know, so they, they were able to do a variety of things that eased over some of the initial Istio adoption hurdles. However, today in a modern Istio deployment, we do most of those things too. So I think if you're looking at a fresh install today of both Linkerd and Istio, Linkerd is likely going to be marginally easier to get up for the for the very simple hello world getting started. Uh, Istio shouldn't be too much harder, but there might be a little bit extra. One of the other areas where there's more complexity to Istio is that there's a lot more resources that are defined. Right. This is there's a lot of so when you install it into Kubernetes, there's more custom resources for Istio than there are for something like Linkerd. And that's another area of that complexity, the surface area that I have to think about or learn about from an API perspective. That's again, both a function of Istio's greater breadth of features, as well as the, the fact that Istio is intended to be used by multiple personas. Um, and so the, I would never expect any individual developer to write, you know, all 20 or 30 of the Istio CRDs. I would expect an application dev to write three to four. I would expect the security team to write one or two. I would expect the platform team to write one or two, right? So that's the other place where we see perceived complexity that, or maybe even legitimate complexity because Istio doesn't make it clear maybe what those lines of ownership of the configuration should be. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers. I see you're, you're flying back. Uh, glad this is a helpful discussion. Hopefully this kind of answers a little bit of the question there around some of the setup pain and like against other meshes. Yeah, good point. Uh, all right. So let's look at uh, uh, eBPF versus Sidecar now, right? There's been a big discussion. There's this new concept, uh, uh, I guess, uh, with eBPF. Uh, what can you first tell people what eBPF is and what's the difference with yeah. the Sidecar model? Yeah. So eBPF, uh, Berkeley Pat, uh, extended Berkeley, Berkeley packet filtering, Ooh, that's a tough one to say 10 times fast, uh, is basically, uh, think of it as a VM that runs inside the kernel in kernel mode. It executes a restricted language called eBPF. Um, <clears throat> and there's a bunch of hooks throughout the kernel to the eBPF runtime. So think of it as almost like a JVM or a restricted JVM that's in the kernel space that can execute a custom program that you provide without making a context switch to user space. So that's baseline what it is. Now, in the kernel, there is something called the express data path, XDP. The express data path is a set of hooks in the network stack for eBPF programs. And so what this does is let us offload a variety of functionality that we would normally do in a user space proxy. We can write as an eBPF program, compile it into that intermediate format, give it to the, to the kernel, and the kernel can execute it for us without a context switch into user space every time a packet comes in. So when we think about the sidecar and what the service mesh is doing, encryption, you know, per packet and per request policy, then it it is obviously very attractive to look at eBPF as part as, as a way to accelerate that or, or a way to maybe implement a lot of the functionality instead of a sidecar. So that's the the baseline what eBPF is. Now, where does it come into the, the service mesh discussion? It primarily comes in with, with isovalence uh, cilium mesh is where a lot of the kind of, I'll, I'll say FUD uh, has, has come from, right? <laughs> this idea that it's EP, eBPF versus sidecar. And you can either have a sidecar in user space and it's slow, but you have the full set of capabilities, or you can have eBPF and it's fast, but there's some stuff that you have to fall back to a to an envoy to be able to do. That's the dichotomy that has been created via marketing. That's fundamentally wrong. So it's not an either or dichotomy. Instead, I would really push people to think of eBPF as an accelerator. eBPF is a way that we can take an existing capability like dropping a packet because it came from the wrong IP address or, or whatever the policy is and pulling it out of the user space envoy and into the kernel. 
the key thing to understand though is that ebpf is working at l4 you can't because so it's a i mentioned it's kind of it's kind of like the jvm uh it's kind of not like the jvm in that it's very restricted so loops there's a fixed loop iteration you can't have unbounded looping you can't have a variety of other types of things the result of that is that an ebpf program is decidable so we can kind of sidestep the halting problem because it's not a full Turing complete programming language. The downside is that you cannot do things like parse an HTTP header in eBPF. Hmm. It's really hard to do L7 policy if you can't do basic things like parse the L7 protocol. And when I say really hard, I mean it is literally impossible. <laughs> Therefore, you know, something like the Cilium Mesh model uses ebpf for the l3 l4 capabilities and then they deploy a, an envoy on the host to handle the l7 capabilities but it's a node uh, it's a it's a demon uh, it's not a, it's not a yeah so it's on the node yeah and so i would never recommend anyone do that from a security perspective you have a confused deputy you have a noisy neighbor problem there's there's a variety of different problems I already mentioned earlier in the call that with NIST, we'll be doing a write-up analyzing the security trade-offs of the, the EV plus node-based proxy versus a sidecar per application proxy uh, versus ambient, which we'll talk about in a minute here as well. Um, so again, I want people to understand it not to be either or, but think of it as and. Instead, what I would recommend is, you know, eBPF, should be used to accelerate some of the capabilities that we go to user space proxy today. Any decision, any packet that I can drop through an eBPF program before I do a user space context switch to hand it to the Envoy sidecar is a net performance win for the system. I save the buffer copy, I save the context switch, I save the, the Envoy processing time, you know, you're looking at something that could happen on the order of a quarter of a millisecond as opposed to like two milliseconds, right? So an order of magnitude improvement in, in performance in the limited cases where you can reject a request using only the L4 capabilities, right? So there's big opportunity to be able to go a lot faster, but the set of use cases where we can do that is limited. So I would suggest that people think of it in terms of offloading capability from a sidecar into eBPF, but you're still going to need a sidecar. And then you can get into the discussion of like, do you put the sidecar on the node or do you keep it per application? Cilium Mesh is putting it per node. Istio is keeping it per application. Um, I, I think you should never put anything that works at L7 on shared on a node. Um, you're asking for, for shared fate outages and, and other problems. Um, so, you know, I think that the end state that we're going to wind up with over the next maybe two or three years in the service mesh space is it will have a combined EVPF plus Envoy data plane that will be deployed per application. And that will be the kind of normal consumption model uh, for the for the mesh. Yeah. So you mentioned Ambient, right? That's another <clears throat> uh, concept that, that came to be as well. Tell us a little bit about what it is. Yeah, so ambient mode in Istio uh, is yet again another deployment model. <laughs> so we have the sidecar model. I have a, an application running, and in the same trust domain as the application, I deploy a proxy. In Kubernetes, that means they're in the same pod. On VMs, that means I put the VM, I put the Envoy on the same host in the same VM as the application itself, in the same trust domain. That's because fundamentally that the sidecar is presenting an identity on behalf of the application to other things on the network. So it makes sense if you're being my, if you're assuming my identity, then you're, you might as well be in my trust domain. The downside of this is that there are a lot of proxies, right? So suppose I deploy like 30 pods on the same host, or I have a large physical host and I have, you know, 10 VMs on it, for example. You know, that means that I'm running like 30 envoys in the pod case or like 10 envoys on the VM case. You know, is there a way that I could run less envoys but still get the capabilities? And I want to run less envoys to be more resource efficient, to, to um, 
you know, have uh, hopefully simpler operations in the system to just simplify things. So Ambient is exactly trying to do that. And so what it does is it kind of goes halfway. If we think of Istio on one side with sidecars, we think of Cilium Mesh on the other side with a host-based Envoy. Ambient goes right in the middle. And what it does is it puts L4 shared on the node. But it deploys a dedicated L7 proxy per service. So the idea is that the L4 part of it, the encryption, the identity, and, and that bit is shared by everything on the same host. But the per request policy, the, the, the L7 capabilities where you have the biggest attack surface to cause shared outages is still dedicated per application. So it's trying to cut a middle ground between having a sidecar dedicated one-to-one, -one, which has resource overhead and waste, and the Cilium model where it's all on the node. And, you know, that's efficient and fast and, and lightweight, but it has bad security properties. So the idea is, you know, can we get a happy middle ground? And so the thought is, you know, shared L4 is safer than shared L7. So that's maybe okay to share. And then we can have dedicated uh, L7 proxies that we route to transparently that implement the sidecar behavior. So the intent is to try and get kind of a middle ground, best of all worlds, where it's a lightweight resource footprint, the security properties are good, the performance, you know, the the uh, the operational characteristics are good, but it's lighter weight than a sidecar. In practice, I expect that in security first environments, we're going to continue to see the sidecar for the foreseeable future. Um, there's a blog post that we have on Ambient. Um, that maybe Nick, if you can link, I think I had sent it to you previously. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll dig it up. Um, that discusses the trade-offs between ambient and sidecar. Um, again, if you're security first, I expect that it's going to be sidecar. Uh, in general, please don't use ambient in production. Like, oh my God, uh, it is not ready. Uh, it's not, it, you know, it is still experimental. Uh, basic things like security uh, are not there yet today. Uh, basic things like how does it interrupt with CNI is not well defined today. So ambient mode in Istio is not yet ready for prime time. But if you want to like kick the kick the tires on in in a Kyan's cluster on your local machine, have at it. Right? Um, it looks promising. There's resource savings. There's potential for performance uh, that's really interesting, uh, but not ready yet. We will have in the next year a write-up from this that analyzes the security trade-offs in detail of the three models of Sidecar, the, the Cilium uh, Mesh Shared L7 model, and the Ambient Shared L4 model. Very cool. So I guess it leads me to my last questions, uh, where obviously you shared a lot of great uh, <clears throat> information here, but people have a tough time keeping up. and. How do people learn all this? So what are your, your tips for learning, I guess? Yeah, it, you know, I think one of the best things that you talk about is the, the importance of investing in yourself and your career, right? Uh, so, you know, one, there's, of course, on your uh, training site, there's, uh, you know, Learn With Nick, there's some preliminary mesh content. There should be more stuff that's arriving from Tetrate there in the, in the future. Secondly, there's academy.tetrate.io. Uh, and there is a ton of really good material. If you, you know, if a lot of what we talked about sounded interesting today, but you you kind of got lost in the details or, or not familiar, there's free training there on Istio uh, called Istio Fundamentals that, that go over what Istio is, what the capabilities are, what it brings. There's free it's training the other on way around, Android right? It's, uh, it's academy.tetrade.io, not, not. Yes, Academy. Yeah. Oh, did I say it the other way? I you said it. You said it. Uh, uh, yeah, you said the academy.io. Here we go. Oh, whoops. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Thank you, Nick, for correcting <laughs> me there. Academy.tetrate.io. Yeah. So free Istio and Envoy training. Uh, there's uh, additionally some workshops like the, the 0 to 60 workshop. There's also paid Istio certification uh, if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing and on in professional certs to, to kind of progress your career. Finally, we actually, that same free Istio training that's on academy.tetrate.io is also on the official CNCF training site. 
Uh, so we announced during KubeCon Detroit uh, a few weeks ago that we donated uh, that training material to the CNCF as part of Istio submission to the CNCF. Uh, and so that uh, on EDX, uh, I believe, uh, is the, the site that the CNCF uses for all of its training. Uh, and so the Istio course that's there is, is from Tetrate as well and, and is, uh, should be valuable. So all of those are great places to go. Additionally, and, and the last one I'll mention is that the Tetrate blog has write-ups on a lot of this stuff as it happens. Um, so if you're curious about ambient mesh, I, you know, Nick linked the in the chat the, the ambient mesh blog post. There's a whole lot of other blog posts and content there around the space and changes in the space. So that's a great place to keep up. Academy.tetrate.io is a great place to go learn uh, more come in, you know, ask questions and, and go from there and we can kind of help guide uh, folks in, in progressing. Yeah, so first of all, I wanted to thank you, Zach, for coming back on the show. This was such a, a great session for people to know what's coming, what's the future of service mesh, why it's so important for people to pay attention to what's going on, uh, both for their velocity and also for their cyber posture and implementation of zero trust and streamlining all this nightmare, how to learn, how to keep up. That was awesome. Uh, we're going to give you the last words, but I wanted to remind everybody of the next episode. Uh, so next Tuesday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, the 29th, uh, we have a great guest again, Greg Tuhill, uh, director of the U.S. CERT, uh, former and first uh, um, federal uh, chief information security officer, Fed CISO of the United States of America. So he's going to join us. He's also a former uh, DHS and Air Force general uh, in the Air Force as well. So he's going to share uh, with us a lot of his journey and what he's learned and kind of see uh, where the future of cyber is going. And so it's going to be an interesting uh, discussion, particularly now uh, with his role in the in the CERT, uh, which is so important for, you know, tra keeping track of, of uh, uh, vulnerabilities and CVs and threats and, and all that good stuff and where, where people need to focus their time to defend their cyber posture. So that's going to be a great discussion next um, uh, week. And, uh, you know, we'll give uh, the last words to you, Zach, and uh, wanted to thank everybody again. Yeah, th thank you, everybody, for spending time. Uh, thanks, Nick, for, for having me on. Uh, I appreciate it. A uh, lot of fun having discussion here. Uh, if anybody has any follow-on questions or anything else, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter. Uh, I'm uh, or even you know uh, GitHub if we're in the, some of the same projects. Uh, I'm Zach Butcher on on all the social media. Uh, so definitely feel free to, to reach out, ask questions uh, or, or anything else. Uh, but, and, you know, thank you. And uh, thanks for taking time today. And thanks everybody. You stay safe. We'll see you next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. And in the meantime, keep up uh, the good work. So, so our kids have a fighting chance at winning against China 20 years from now. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>